I like to think uh, that students, teachers, and staff are prepared in case the unthinkable should happen in their school. The overwhelming majority of states now require school shooting drills. Correspondent Kelly Beeson joins me now. Kelly, uh, there is a real push to make certain that all this practice is helpful uh, and not sometimes hurtful. Yeah, you're certainly right, Brian. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Education Association, Sandy Hook Promise, these are all organizations that are saying protection of classrooms is critical, yet so too is the protection of our students' mental health. We've seen the drills. <laughs> the stage simulations. Two shooters working on a description right now. The actual fear. Indeed, the worry is all of this practicing in our nation's schools is having a serious impact on mental health. In fact, a Georgia Tech study found that after a school shooter drill, students reported a 39% increase in depression and a 42% increase in stress. Whether or not you actually have a shooting, an actual shooting versus a simulated, you're creating the same physiological response, serotonin, dopamine, crisis, flight or fight. So to me, you're actually creating a traumatic experience. In recommending that school districts re-examine how they're doing these drills, the American Academy of Pediatrics detailed one recent live exercise in which high school students were deceived to believe it was a real event. Children sobbed hysterically, vomited, or fainted. Some children sent farewell notes to parents. There should be a permission slip. Do I want my child in this drill or not? So there should be an awareness. And then the child should be prepped ahead of time. And if you don't want your child to have it at school, it should be done at home. Those recommendations line up with the American Academy of Pediatrics, which suggests no deception meaning pretending that the drill is real, no fake blood or corpses, no using gunshot sounds, and no predatory actors or rattling doors. It was kind of frightening because we were just sitting there in silence and all of a sudden someone shakes the door handle. But in this era where the scenes of actual school shootings dominate the headlines, there's strong consensus that lockdown practice done safely and properly should certainly be on the curriculum. At this time, our lockdown drill is complete. It looked like a ghost town. It looked like a school on a Saturday when there's just no students in sight. And that, that's what we want. And Dr. McDermott recommends letting your child set the tone after a lockdown drill. Ask questions, but stay neutral, since some students don't find them upsetting at all. And she also personally treats her child to a quick, fun outing the day of the drill to imprint a positive memory that's then associated with that safety practice, Brian. Seems like good advice. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, Max Schachter is going to join us now. He lost his son, Alex, in the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, in Parkland, Florida. Uh, and he is the founder and executive director of Safe Schools uh, for Alex. Max, thank you um, for being with me. Uh, I met you shortly after Parkland. It's always amazed me how you have turned your grief uh, into this mission to make schools throughout the entire country safe. Uh, and yet we see in Texas that this gunman walked right into the school through an open door, uh, and then we learn about this uh, police response uh, that was subpar at best. They didn't follow the training that even they had recently received. I mean, you've worked so hard, Max. That's got to be so frustrating to see. It's, it's heartbreaking, Brian. You know from being in this community many, many times that the reason we started Safe Schools for Alex is to prevent this from ever happening again. And I travel the country and I present all over to many, many law enforcement agencies, specifically on the failed law enforcement response. Whereas you know that we had nine of the Broward Sheriff's Office deputies stay outside while the shooting was happening. The SRO never went in. And the shooter, the murderer, would have never gotten on campus if they did not unlock the gates and the gates were staffed uh, properly. And the Parkland murderer exited an Uber, walked right onto campus. He walked through an unlocked uh, door to the 1200 building, and no one ever called a code red. 
So what's so frustrating, everything I've been doing for the last four years is preaching about if we just implement the lessons that we learned after Parkland, we know that we can save lives. And it looks like all the mistakes from Parkland were repeated and then some uh, in, in Uvalde. And it's just heartbreaking. And I feel so, so horrible for all these families that, that are now having to bury their loved ones. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's frustrating. Um, the U.S. Department of Justice, as you know, uh, Max, has now said they're going to do a thorough review of what happened to find out what went wrong. But it doesn't seem that complicated. I mean, we can already tell what went wrong, right? Basically, the same mistakes as Columbine and the same mistakes uh, as Parkland. Yeah, you know, after, after Parkland, I, I had this idea where we needed to create national school safety standards and national school safety best practices. And the best practices are teacher needs to be teaching with a locked door. You, uh, you know, as soon as you can call a code red and lock that ch the children down, that they want to make sure that they're in a safe space. And, you know, it, what we have learned so far is that the shooter was outside firing at the school. Well, when that happens, you've got to lock that school down. It does not look like that happened. And the children uh, were not secure. The gunman walked right into an unlocked classroom door. And that is really the nightmare situation. And then to have law enforcement arrive and to be hearing calls and uh, calls from 911 from inside the, the classroom, multiple, multiple calls from the kids in that classroom saying there are, p there are kids alive in here please come in and for law enforcement to stay outside is just unacceptable and inexcusable. And I think it's important that the Justice Department is doing an investigation, but there is there, we've got, you know, there's so many mass shootings. We should not be complacent in this society about what to do when an active shooter happens. When that murderer was firing on that campus, that is an active shooter situation and they should have gone right in. So it's just heartbreaking again to see the failures. And that's why, you know, there needs to be a layered approach. Uh, unfortunately, people are going to make mistakes. That's why you've got to have layers of of protections, uh, concentric rings of security. But the most important thing is you've got to stop the killing and then you've got to stop the dying. And, and neither of that happened. And it's just heartbreaking because we know that when these incidents happen, if, if you do not stop an arterial bleed within five minutes, your chances of, of living are extremely minute. So. We, we've got to do a better job, and I'm hoping that this report by the Justice Department highlights some best practices and lessons learned so that this never happens again. It should never happen again. Max, when I was in Uvalde last week, I found myself thinking about you several times because I was looking at these families and, and just thinking to myself, gosh, they are just now starting this process that that you went through unfortunately and i know you've spoken to families in the past um that find themselves in this situation i mean what do you say to these families you know brian that was the worst day in my life the night before trying to write alex's eulogy when you know i was just at a loss it was five in the morning and i was going through uh, with my son trying to figure out what to say. And we looked in the trash can and out, we, we pulled this, this, this poem that Alex had written called Life is Like a Roller Coaster. And, uh, you know, I had no idea that Alex was, was a poet and, and he had no idea that his life was gonna end like this. Uh, but it, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, and I've traveled to many of these, these horrible tragedies. And what I say to these families is that you know, I know where you're where you're at. I've been there and I know that that they're hoping that this is just a nightmare that they can wake up from. But, uh, you know, every time I'm with pa families that have gone through this, it, it helps. It helps me and it helps them to know that that they are they'll never uh, move on but they will move forward every day because they have uh, they might have other children they have loved ones they they have a spouse a husband or a wife 
or um, and so they have to. They will, and they'll do the same thing that the 17 Parks Parkland families have done. They will do everything in their power to keep their loved one's memory alive. They might start a charity or, or or do whatever, but that's that's our goal in life. That's why I started Safe Schools for Alex is to get the message out that if we implement the lessons learned uh, after Parkland and after Uvalde, uh, they they should know that that the horribleness that that it was, uh, there will be uh, there will come about. Uh, kids' lives will be saved because uh, of their tragedy. I, I can I can promise them that. Gosh, I hope so. Max, um, thank you for joining us and thanks for all the hard work that you continue to do. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.